Well, good morning, everyone. I think we will get started for those of you who are online and for those of you who will be joining us later. Can everyone hear me? I just want to do a sound check. Can everybody hear me? If you could just, in the chat feature, just give me a little note that... Perfect. I'm glad everyone can. Wonderful. This lecture is being recorded so that, that you can refer to it at a later time or that you will be able to, if you're not able to attend this morning, then you can um, archive it for your viewing pleasure at a later date. Uh, I'm hoping that you find the Zoom format works for you, that uh, it's another alternative to a face-to-face -face class, especially on blustery cold winter mornings, the first morning back. I hope that you all had a wonderful holiday and I just wanted to um, wish you a wonderful 2018 and that um, it is it is your the best year you've had uh, and that everyone uh, gets caught up and doesn't feel stressed doing all uh, doing their exams later in the month. Anyways, so uh, we're today going to talk about medical surgical emergencies, and it's, we've sort of touched on them throughout the course because every every week we've had a few emergencies, but we're going to bring them all together, and we'll talk a little bit about some common threads, and then I'd like to finish up the presentation with a talk a talk about. Uh, the final exam, and I have some thoughts, and I'm about how it's going to how it's going to unfold, and I'd like to um, share those with you at the end of this recorded session. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen. And we will get started with. This more, oh, okay, and so with the learning objective, where did my learning obje my learning objectives go? So the learning objectives for this session are describe nursing assessment and management of a patient experiencing respiratory and cardiac distress, compare collaborative nursing management of, of patients with various um, types of shock, and we're going to look at hypovolemic shock, anaphylactic shock, and distributive shock. Describe assessment and collaborative management of the patient describing angina or myocardial infarction. Describe the assessment of a patient under experiencing malignant hyperthermia. Describe assessment and collaborative management of a patient experiencing a seizure. Describe assessment and collaborative management of the patient experiencing compartment syndrome. And describe as, uh, assessment and collaborative management of a patient experiencing a wound dehiscence. So we got a lot to talk about. Now, I'd like to, if you need me to um, stop at any point, you let me know. Please use the chat feature or just unmute yourself and, and call out an answer. Probably best if we only have one or two people unmuted at a time, but certainly I'll manage that. And I see there's a, let me see. Where's the PowerPoint? The PowerPoint should be in the final week. It may look a little different color, but it's all the same sort of information. So in week 12, you shall find it under medical surgical emergencies. And I see another chat feature. Oh, you're welcome. And if there's any problems with that, just let me know. Oh, there's my learning objective. So I'd like to start, first of all, with shock. This is a very important concept. And as we've talked about in the past, shock occurs at the microcellular level far in advance of patients having signs and symptoms of shock. And so this is really important. And typically when I do this lecture, I have people sign uh, attendance records because this is such an important concept that there was a, a case where um, the a patient at SickKids ended up ha experiencing shock. A new grad missed it, uh, unaware of those salient features or those subtle features and remember that's what I'm targeting is those subtle features and so they did not they missed those early signs of shock and so the patient died and when it went to an inquest the the students there were the new grad and said oh I don't recall ever being taught 
about shock. And so all the nursing schools had to produce how they teach shock in their program. And from that point forward, because of the litigation, I've always keep an attendance record of, of the shock lecture. So um, I know that we've got the six folks online that are or more by now we've got those time stamped in uh those others that will be looking at it i'll be able to retrieve those records as you grab them um and so it will be really important that you understand that shock and the salient features of shock and even my one of my earlier experiences with shock and i think i've shared with you is my first maternal death when early signs of shock were missed it's when that heart rate went up from 70 to 95 and the the, the new nurse thought, well, I guess it's just because she's in pain. I'll give her something more for pain. When in fact, the blood pressure was also starting to trend down and there was some widening of that pulse pressure. So again, these salient features of shock are so important. And so really important that um, you are understanding of those, those, er, those early signs of shock. So shock really is circulatory insufficiency, uh, circulatory insufficiency and altered metabolism. And so the body has, as you know, and as um, I, I love Dr. Coffee when she refers to it as the body has a lot of redundancy. And so we have some backup mechanisms as the body starts to fail. And really shock is that hypoperfusion, capillary hypoperfusion, and widespread cellular malfunction. So it starts right at the microcellular level. And I'm sure that you've had this in your um, in patho already. Um, so we're going to look at it from a different perspective. But really, shock is really when the cells are deprived of oxy oxygen and nutrient uh, nutrients. The cellular cells start to malfunction. They need that ATP. There is no source of ATP, so they start into altered metabolism. And so this. Uh, they start this um, altered metabolism, they go into aerobic metabolism, and it, it, in the end result, it ends up with an acidosis. And as I've mentioned many times before, the heart does not like to work in an acidotic environment. So it's not even, it can't function under substandard conditions. So it can't even meet the demands of the body. Initially, as I said, there's a lot of redundancies built in the body. And so the body is able to cope initially with that increased. Uh, heart rate is trying so desperately to maintain perfusion, and so it's going to do, have compensatory mechanisms, vasoconstriction, increased heart rate to increase uh, to meet those demands of the body, and then eventually it just all peters right out as every system is exhausted. So initially, at initial stages of shock, it's really not apparent the patient is in shock. Uh, and so, as I said, it's happening at the microcellular level initially. And so that's when the body switches from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. And that's when we start to see a little bit of lactate buildup or that lactic acidosis. Then it moves into that secondary phase or the compensatory where we have neural, hormonal, and biochem biochemistry, bio biochemical compensatory mechanisms. And so this is when we start to see that heart rate increase by just a little bit, by 10 beats, by 10 beats per minute. Um, that blood pressure starts to drop and you see that, uh, that initially that narrowing in the early stages, that narrowing as the body tries so hard to, to maintain adequate perfusion pressure. And remember that we talked about the mean arterial pressure that mean arterial pressure is the average between systole and diastole. Remember, there is an, an actual equa equation, two-thirds diastole plus one-third systole divided by three. Don't worry about that, but it is an equation. If you look on your non-invasive blood pressure cuffs, it does it for you automatically. And so try to train your eye to look at the mean. Although you're looking at the systolic and the diastolic, look at the mean because the mean is really what the average of that is as the body is compensating. So look at the mean because it should be between 60 and 100 to maintain adequate perfusion. So initially the blood pressure vasoconstricts so that it, you have an increased diastolic and narrowing of the pulse pressure. The baroreceptors in the aortic, um, in the aortic arch and the carotid bodies start to sense that decrease in the blood pressure and they start to com compensate by potent vasoconstriction. Those alpha receptors in the periphery, they vasoconstrict and they end up uh, with a neural 
or, or hormonal secretion, you get your epinephrine and your norepinephrine secreted, again, to cause massive vasoconstriction in the periphery and to give you that get up and go, that fight or flight response, the heart rate's going to increase. Um, blood is also shunted away from non-essential organs. Well, I'm not sure which of my organs would be considered non-essential. However, um, when your body is under such stress and fighting to live, uh, your end, the body will shunt blood to the brain, the heart, and the lungs in order to uh, maintain circulation. It will shunt blood away from the gut. And we often say, in, in, in my years in intensive care, if we, we need to perfuse essential organs, we can deal with a hypoperfusion of the gut later. And you'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, so we can deal with that. The liver takes a first hit because blood is being shunted, so you're going to see liver enzymes elevated. Kidneys take a huge hit um, because we know we can that, that um, blood needs to go to the brain, the heart, and the lungs, and so blood will be rede redirected from the kidneys and from the um, liver and the GI tract. From the skin, that's why we get cold, clammy skin. And then we go into, and don't worry about the stages, but just to know that there are three, dis four discrete stages. And when I was at it, actually invited to an inquest, the lawyer for the pros well, I guess the prosecution, um, asked me, so what stage of shock was the patient in when you received them into the intensive care unit? And so my response was that nurses don't diagnose. So I, well, I knew at the back of my mind, we were going down the wrong pathway. I really, we, nurses don't diagnose. So don't worry about knowing that this is progressive shock and this is uh, end organ. Don't worry about that. But to know that there are four discrete stages, there's that initial stage that you don't really see with, when everything is occurring at the microcellular level. Then you have the compensatory mechanism where blood is shunted to the heart, the lungs, um, and the brain so that essential pro processes can, can occur. Blood is redirected away from the periphery. I don't need blood in my toes right now. I need it in my brain. So it's sh blood is shunted away from the periphery and going towards the vital organs. And then progressive stage when the compensatory mechanisms begin to fail and the body is just exhausted. So. Um, the progressive stage is when everything starts to fail. You're seeing a lot of cellular dysfunction and necrosis. So this is when you're going to see um, changes in the membrane permeability as well. And so um, fluid is escaping out into the intravascular space and not staying into the inter in in the, within the vasculature, which further exacerbates hypotension. So compensatory mechanisms fail. You have decreased cellular perfusion. Uh, you have altered capillary membrane permeability. You end up with getting fluid seeping into your lungs. So now your lungs are already compromised, and you're now going into fulminant or bad pulmonary edema. Fulminant means very um, pathological or lethal uh, pulmonary edema. Uh, there is increased workload of that heart. That heart is trying desperately to save this this body and preserve homeostasis. And so this heart is increasing, but again, it's becoming um, ischemic. And so you're going to see uh, a lot of arrhythmias, a lot of, and the patient's going to show some ST changes as the body, as the heart is not perfused. Of course, as I mentioned, that there's going to be decreased urine output because the kidneys and the liver take the first hit. So you're going to see uh, increase in urine creatinine, decrease in urinary production, urine production, less than one mil per kilo. And you're going to see um, that the liver, as it's starting to slowly become necrotic, that it's the body needs a lot of energy, and so it's going to be trying to uh, um, uh, convert glucose, so uh, performing gluconeogenesis, converting that glucose so that you have a, a store of glucose to feed the brain, the heart, the lungs, and um, so you're going to see elevated sugars as well and other um, harmful processes occur. And I, I talk about disseminated intravascular coagulation, which I'm going to take out, and we'll readdress DIC in, as, a, as a more advanced concept in synthesis or year four. So disseminated intravascular coagulation is a, a consumptive disorder in which you have both 
uh, clotting and fibrinolysis occurring at the same time. So your platelets are are being used up because you're you're clotting all over your body and it's using it using them all up. Uh, and then you're you're because you've used all your platelets, everything is bleeding. So you're massively bleeding at the same time. And so um, as this continues, you're, you enter the refractory phase when the body is cold and clammy and diaphoretic. The heart rate is now dropping. The blood pressure is dropping. Your mean arterial pressure may be 40 or 30. And the, the compensatory mechanisms are certainly overwhelmed and death ensues. So it is a very tragic situation uh, that occurs at the micro, as I said, the, at the at the microcellular level first. And so shock is really defined as the inability of the circulatory system to supply adequate oxygen nutrients to the tissues. And there's really three essential reasons. So either it's you're, you lack pump, you're, the pump is not primed, the pump is ineffective, um, or there's ineff ineffective volume. So you're, it's some kind of an issue with the heart. There's uh, ineffective pumping action. So the car heart's not effectively getting oxygens and nutrients out over to the, to the, the body. Uh, that there is some problem with the circulatory system itself and then inadequate blood volume. So this is when the heart fails to pump, there's inadequate blood volume or the circulatory system is already comprised. And then without it, it, it uh, quick interventions, uh, immediate interventions, because once there's already that necrosis of the cell at the microcellular level, it's very difficult to sort of pull them all back. So the underlying mechanisms really... Um, are cellular oxygen deprivation so that we're not getting oxygen to the cells, we're not getting uh, nutrients to the cells, we're not getting energy, there's, there's no source of energy for the cells, and we're not getting rid of the waste products. So also, it, as while you're not getting adequate nutrients, you're also not able to get rid of it, the nutrients, the um, w excess waste products as well. And so you, you find that the cells do not, are not getting the oxygen nutrients and they begin to produce uh, alternate sources of energy. So they're going to produce ATP anaerobically. That's when they, it's not as effective. So you're not getting the actual uh, energy um, source. So you don't have adequate energy source and you have lactic buildup. This is when they, the cells actually begin to swell because of uh, alterations in the process, it also alters the cellular um, membrane. And so not only at the, at the microcellular level do you have alteration in the, the membrane permeability, but all through the body. And so we'll talk about that in a moment. And then as it progresses, the sodium potassium pump can't function without ADP and it deactivates. So I hope you're getting this real picture of this system that is totally overwhelmed. So the beauty of our body is there's many redundancies. However, when we are faced in situations such as overwhelming shock, uh, these mechanisms fail. And so as I mentioned, the... Um, there's three main types of shock. One is hypovolemic shock when the tank is empty. So, and no matter what you do, whatever intervention you're administering, if you don't fill up the tank, you're not going anywhere. So, um, the tank is empty. Cardiogenic shock is simply um, the engine won't work. So there, you've, you've, you've turned it on, but you're not going anywhere. There's not enough... Um, blood, oxygen, nutrients being uh, taken to the other parts of the body. So it's caused by heart failure of any kind. Uh, and I also want to highlight that you can have um, ischemic kind of car cardiac or structural cardiac problems as well. So if you uh, had a rupture in the wall of the heart or you had a, a, a one of those cordonite tendinae, remember the cordonite tendinae, or one of those leaflets, the uh, flail leaflet that's not closing correctly. So there's all kinds of things that can cause cardiogenic shock. 
Then there's this other concept that of distributive shock. So the vessels become too big. So there's some reason why you've got these big, huge, giant vessels, but there's not a little sprinkle going through it. And so this could be caused by neurogenic anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the most common cause or septic shock. And as I've already talked about, there's these three phases of shock where we had initially, where the initial stage of shock is really undetected. It's all occurring at the microcellular level. This is the most concerning to me um, because it's occurring and there's really no signs of it. I want to remind everyone that the vital signs, when they change, it is a later sign of shock. And we've missed those earlier, those earlier signs. So compensatory shock is when nerves and hormones that are, are, are used to help protect the body um, and to maintain the blood pressure and the volume within the normal limits or the best it can. So the, that's when your heart rate will go up by 10 beats. That's when the, you see that narrowing of the pulse pressure because there's massive vasoconstriction in the periphery uh, to help shunt blood back to the heart. Uh, you're going to see the um, the RAS, the RAS, reticula, the renin angiotensin system secrete because there's not enough blood flow to the kidneys, and so it's going to secrete to try and reabsorb uh, sodium and fluids, uh, and so anything that's going to help increase that intravascular volume, and then the progressive is when everything begins to fail and you have inadequate perfusion and then you're going to have irreversible shock so even if you gave uh, all the blood products in your blood bank even if you were able to do a quick intervention get up some medication the cells are all necrotic and there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to help i'm going to stop there because i think that i have a couple of questions here in my chat feature so let me just see what we've got oh you've does anyone know what chapter this is in the textbook? It really isn't in a chapter, Anisha. Uh, this is, it, it's really um, an overview from every chapter about some of those complications that you're going to see. And I do want to remind everyone, thank you for that great question. I do want to remind everyone that uh, what I'm teaching you is really what you need to learn when you go to the units. So these are things you're going to see every day on the units that you're working on to help you to understand and to mitigate or to stop or to reverse any of those issues. So um, it's, there's not one chapter, it's an accumulation of all. And I see somebody's typing in a message, so go right ahead. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to carry on then. The compensatory stage of shock. And so what does comp comp compensated compensatory stage of shock look like? It's really specific to the type of shock that there is. So for instance, if it would look different from cardiogenic shock versus septic shock. The priority at this stage is really to, to treat the underlying disorder. So if it is a myocardial infarction, we need to open up those vessels quickly so that we can perfuse the heart. If it is anaphylaxis, we need to um, neutralize that antigen, anti antibody response. Uh, if it's hypovolemic shock, we need to give massive, uh, uh, massive infusions, whether it be blood or other, other fluids. But for all types, we must treat the underlying disorder to prevent irreversible damage to cells. And this relies upon the mechanisms of homeostasis. So that, again, that's what we just mentioned. You're going to have an increase in the heart rate. You're going to have the, the massive vasoconstriction in the periphery that will give you that narrowing pulse pressure. You're going to have activation of the RAS system. So all of those compensatory mechanisms will serve to help improve intravascular volume. It will help to improve the, the pump action of the heart. It will have help perfuse the vital organs. And so uh, we'll start with hypovolemic shock. This is just gives you a little bit of a, uh, of a 
conceptual model because I'm, you know, me, I like those pictures. So you have a decreased intervascular volume. So let's say this is a stabbing. This patient had bled out uh, liters and liters on the street. Or this could be an elderly patient. And I want to caution you that shock in the elderly, they don't have the uh, compensatory mechanisms that the, that a younger adult would have. And so while a young person could bleed out two liters or two and a half liters with little um, a little effect, so a liter, liter and a half, um, that an older adult, maybe only 500 mils, and they're going to start to show signs of uh, of compensation. So you're going to have a decrease in intervascular volume. You're going to have a fall in the cardiac output. So if you don't have the amount of volume going into the heart, you're not going to have the same amount of volume coming out of the heart. That will release, that will uh, stimulate the release of adrenaline and noradrenaline. The compensatory mechanism results in an increase in heart rate and an increase in the SVR. Systemic vascular resistance. So you're going to have an increase in the heart rate and the SVR, systemic vascular resistance. You, you may also note this as peripheral vascular resistance. I'm not sure how they teach it in, in patho. Whatever the term is, the systemic vascular resistance, it means that the periphery is clamped down. It's be, the alpha receptors are stimulated in the periphery as part of the sympathetic response, clamps down, shunts blood. I don't need blood in my baby toe, but I need it in my heart, my brain, and my lungs. So it's going to increase the heart rate, increase the SVR, and that will uh, it result in increased cardiac output. Coming along, this left side, um, there's good, that you're going to see a, a, a shift in the interstitial fluid. So fluid's going to be reabsorbed um, due to release of aldosterone and ADH. And then you're going to have this disengorgement of spleen. So if the spleen holds a lot of fluid, it's going to actually liberate that. So there's more intravascular volume, which will increase blood volume and increase cardiac output. So our body, as I, as I mentioned, has wonderful redundancies, wonderful compensatory mechanisms. And so the blood pressure, uh, so you maintain, as I said, you maintain adequate blood pressure. Um, you don't see vital sign changes at this stage. So the initial stages, you don't see any change in vital signs. Even at the compensatory stage, you don't see any change in vital signs. Your blood pressure is reasonable. You have up to 1,500 mils of, of uh, you, you can uh, um, experience up to 1,500 mils of loss. Now that could be, fluid loss of any description. That could be um, vomiting, it could be blood loss, it could be some kind of a hemorrhage, it could be diarrhea, um, any of those before you would see signs of hypovolemic shock. And just sometimes I find it, and it took me a while to understand, you can have hypovolemia before you end up with hypovolemic shock. Shock is microcellular dysfunction. So I just want to clarify those two points. So when, you, um, when you're assessing the patient, you're looking at their color, their, touch, their temperature. Remember that we touch, do our temperature with the backs of our hands, looking at the heart rate, the general state. There's an increase in the respiratory rate uh, to have help the body rid of lactic acidosis or lactic acid. Um, and so because of this... Um, lactic acidosis, you may see, in fact, a change in the level of consciousness. So again, early, early indications that something is not correct is, is a change in level of consciousness. So that patient becomes restless. And as I mentioned, uh, when, a, when a patient, I've had to ask them to put the oxygen on more than twice, then I'm thinking they're not mentating and I've got to find out what is the cause. So you know, p patients are um, constantly taking off their oxygen. That they, they, don't, they don't understand because they're not getting enough brain, uh, oxygen to their brain. And so they end up with this, this lactic acidosis, which will result in an alteration in mentation. Also, they're not getting oxygen to their brain or nutrients, glucose to their brain. And so you end up with this alteration in the level of consciousness. It's not going to be that they're patient will present obtunded or or overtly confused it will be those subtle changes and that's what i'm trying to help you understand that so subtle changes where the patients ripped off their oxygen twice sir please put, put your oxygen back on 
Uh, can I help you put your oxygen back on? Okay, something is not going on here. I need to go and investigate. Are they hypoxic? Are they in early signs of shock? What's going on? And so it's those early changes. Um, they might be some that are, they're they're kicking their blankets off, or they're restless in the bed. They're shifting position a lot. Any of those sort of indications of an alteration alteration in their mental status. Their color becomes pale. That's those people that um, have that pallor, and we, we talk about pallor, as the blood is shunted away from the superficial skin to deep into the, into the organs that need it. So their color becomes very pale. Temperature's cold. They don't need blood, they don't need blood to the superficial skin. They need blood to their heart, brain, and lungs. So their skin becomes cool or cold. And then they start to become clammy. Uh, their heart rate pops up by about just 10 beats. So their heart rate could be normally 60, 65, and then all of a sudden you notice that it's 75. Still well within normal, but it's that, that trend that has elevated it. And so you're going to be looking at the heart rate and overall general state. Do you see any over signs of bleeding? Um, is there any, you know, bug bites if it's anaphylaxis? Um, so in this particular case, do you, is there any, have they had any history of um, exposure to C. difficile or something that's going to cause them to have GI losses or are they vomiting? Have they had chemotherapy and they're, they've just had this prolonged vomiting? Um, have they had surgery and now they're, they're bleeding out? And remember that one trick that I, I mentioned to you about postural drop. So I would do a blood pressure with the patient supine. And if they were stable, I would put the elevate the head of the bed and then give it five minutes to re-equilibrate and check their blood pressure. And if there's more than a 10 to 15 millimeter of mercury drop, then I'm thinking, ooh, this patient's hypovolemic. Looking at their respiratory rate. And so the treatment for hypovolemic shock is... Uh, oxygenation. And so, first of all, you need to make sure that the patient gets has adequate oxygenation, and you need to optimize their ventilation. So they may be if they may be breathing either they may be tachypnic or bradypnic. So you need to make sure that uh, their their saturations are within you know over ninety five. Uh, if not, may need to have some may need to have. Uh, external O2. And the, the, the current thinking is that as long as their SATs are okay, and you know that their, their heart rate correlates with their SAT, and that they look, and please, don't underestimate your clinical assessment. If they don't look well, put the oxygen on until you get it all sorted out. In the short term, that is absolutely fine. Their SATs are 95, but they don't look well. Put on oxygen, get it sorted out. Once their SATs are over 95, then you can consider removing it. Um, so oxygenation is priority. And remember, it's always the ABCs. We're always looking at ABCs. We do a primary survey. Airway, um, are, they, are they able to maintain their airway? Are they so far down the shock continuum that they're, they're drowsy or tundra that they may aspirate? Um, so make sure that they're able to protect their own airway, that they're able to speak with you, that their Glasgow Coma Scale is greater than nine, and that they're able to they're able to um, uh, protect their airway and speak to you. Uh, breathing, that they're able to, uh, that the respiratory rate is you know, 12 to 20, like as normal. Although if there's other metabolic processes going on, you may find that their respiratory rate is irregular. And so it may need an arterial blood gas to assess their oxygenation. You need to quickly optimize intravascular volume. You need to replenish and fluid resuscitate. So two large bore IVs uh, administering a crystalloid solution. So uh, we alluded to this before. Uh, crystalloid solution is a solution, and I always think of it as salt crystals. So anything such as normal saline or Ringer's lactate, they have large... Um, crystals, so large salt crystals, and that will help draw fluid in the intervascular space. <clears throat> and so uh, with, with hypovolemic shock, you want to get two IVs established. 
generally they're in the anticubital fossa, so in those big, large veins in the crook of their arm. You want to get two large bore bor IVs in and start administering fluid. If it's just um, if it's GI losses, then you can administer a crystalloid solution. If it is a bleed, you the patient requires blood products. When you are administering fluid so quickly, um, you need to be always observing the the patient's tolerance of any intervention, but especially when you're giving a lot of fluid. So watch for fluid overload and hypothermia because you're giving a lot of fluid at room temperature, which is what, 80 degrees at best. And so if you're giving a lot of a liter or an hour or two liters an hour, we can give it quite quickly uh, to some situations. And so you're going to bring down their core temperature. And do remember when we bring down the core temperature, the platelets stop working. And so you're going to have a worse situation. So um, while you're infusing this inter these large bore IVs, and, and so what we would tend to do for massive uh, infusions, fluid infusion, but also blood transfusion, we would put it through a blood warmer. And so we would um, optimize the intravascular volume and watching for fluid overload. So as soon as I start my fluid bolus for any situation, it could be just a mere, give the patient 500 mils. I'm going to do a baseline assessment of auscultate their chest, and then I'm going to listen to it every 15 minutes thereafter. You want to figure out what, it, you know, identify the underlying cause so that there can be a targeted intervention. You want to, the patient needs to have opti optimized their cardiac output. So this may necessitate um, potent medications generally administered in the emergency or critical care setting. So medications that optimize cardiac output for hypovolemic shock would be um, a potent vasoconstrictor such as adrenaline or dopamine. Infusion. And so the only caveat to that is that you do need to do fluid resuscitation. As I mentioned, we could give all the dopamine in the world, but if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have it replenished the, vol the volume or the fluid loss, then this is not going to be effective. So really ensure that you have um, that the patient has had fluid resuscitation and that uh, that they optimize the cardiac output with the medications. Um, oxygen, as I mentioned, may be just simple O2 nasal prongs until you get the patient sorted out, or it may be a high flow oxygen. And remember that when you are adding high flow oxygen, it may be a non rebreather mask where they have a reservoir underneath the mask. I should have brought one, but they have a reservoir under the mask. That the oxygen has to be at the dialed at the wall up to 15 liters, so it has to be flush. Uh, assess the level of consciousness and the, using the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, the, this patient would be an ideal candidate for um, ca catheterization. So you want to follow the urinary output as a guide of, of adequate cardiac output. So a mil per, per kilo per hour or roughly 30 mils per hour in an adult would be would be sufficient. I mean, I wouldn't want to see greater, but that's the bare minimum is 30 mils per hour. And so as you are re fluid resuscitating this patient, monitor the urinary output. So a Foley catheter will be very helpful. Uh, what else do I want? Um, I think we you'll hear the, the term colloids. So crystalloids are the, is normal saline, ringer's lactate, large salt crystal, pulling all the fluid into the intravascular system. We used to use um, colloids which uh, would um, help to push the fluid back in at, because of the way it worked at the capillary level. The new evidence shows that that's not really as, as beneficial and can sometimes be detrimental. So we definitely use colloid, crystalloids. Not, not as often do we use colloids. Colloids are, um, colloids would be um, uh, such as, uh, Voluvan or Pentaspan, those volume spenders. They're how to start. They're head of starches. They're like a potato starch, so they're a different molecule, and it just provides volume. So I can give 500 mils of voluven, and that's like giving three liters. So I'm not actually giving the fluid, but I'm getting that draw. So sometimes they're indicated, but not as a as a common rule. And so. Uh, Again, be alert to complications from 
from the interventions. And so this is a patient that's probably being monitored in the ICU, so it needs close, close monitoring. Okay, cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock. Uh, now, just before, so okay, we'll carry on here. Cardiogenic shock results from heart failure. It's really considered the, when the engine malfunctions. So there's something wrong. We, you know, we've got this, everything's go, everything is go, but the engine doesn't go. Cardiogenic shock has a very high mortality, even to this day, even with all the interventions that we have. There is a considered a, a um, high mortality with an uh, with um, an eighty percent mortality, and so the normal compensatory mechanisms lead to ultimate heart damage. So it results from heart failure, and it's really when the heart loses that contractile function, and typically it would affect the left ventricle and then whatever affects the left ventricle goes on to affect the right ventricle. It can, cardiogenic shock can occur because of uh, an ischemia from a large myocardial infarction, typically on the left, left, in the left ventricle. So remember we talked about the LAD, the left anterior descending or the circumflex that goes round behind the heart. Those are often infarcted. It will lead to cardiogenic shock because you've lost that pump action. End stage cardiomyopathy, so the heart that's this big old baggy heart doesn't just can hardly even push out 30 mils. Valve dysfunction, as I mentioned, and an aneurysm, a ventricular aneurysm. So you have like an outpoaching in the heart itself. And so that can cause because all the all the 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 blood is going into this little aneurysm and not going out to the rest of the body. It's sitting in that aneurysm. And so as the cardiogenic shock ensues, you have a decrease in the cardiac output. The sympathetic nervous system tries to, to maintain, uh, maintain homeostasis. It triggers all the compensatory mechanisms. It, it, um, in, it, it, it increases the heart rate. It, it really flogs those kidneys to increase fluid retention. Uh, sodium and potassium, sodium retention, and then ultimately fluid retention. And so now tell me, what is the problem with that? So we have this failing heart that is already being flogged because it's not, it doesn't have an, an, enough of the cardiac open. Don't forget, the heart takes it right up, the first out of the ventricle. They take their share, then, then a good Lion share goes up to the brain and then the rest goes to the body. And so the heart of it, the heart is already ischemic and not getting enough blood flow. Then you're now the compensatory mechanisms are going to increase that heart rate, so it increases the demands on a failing heart. Then you're going to have uh, uh, increased fluid. So now you've got this patient that has fluid in their lungs because the, everything is backing up from the left ventricle. You've got pulmonary edema, you've got fluid in their lungs, and now as a compensatory mechanism, the kidneys are bringing, that are, are retaining more fluid. And so it really, it, it actually overwhelms the systems even doubly because this failing heart is already struggling to, to maintain. So now you have widespread um, impaired cellular metabolism that leads to, to signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock. People that are at higher risk, as I mentioned, are the older adult. Females are at, at higher risk. Uh, patients with diabetes, you'll find that diabetes is really a, a trigger for almost all of our conditions. History of MIs and a large infarct. So this is the patient that comes in with the TNK of 50. Lopped off a big portion of that left ventricle. So... As we mentioned, early signs of cardiogenic shock are those, it's that restlessness, you know, they're just shifting in the bed all the time, they're kicking their blankets, that, you know, you've pulled them up, you've pulled the blankets over them, and then they're exposed again. Their gowns are off. These are the patients that, this is early signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock, restlessness, confusion, change, and al or alteration of their mental status. That's when you see an increase in the heart rate. Uh, decrease in the peripheral pulses because blood doesn't need to be in my big my big toe, but it needs to be in my heart. Decrease urinary output and they uh, experience weakness. They may become cold and clammy and experience a uh, circumoral cyanosis. 
and peripheral cyanosis. Um, they become short of breath because of uh, pulmonary edema. There's, they've, they've got so much fluid in their lungs already. They could experience nausea and vomiting. vomiting. And again, because of the influence, the hormonal influence of the, of the flight or flight response or sympathetic nervous stimulation, then you're going to see uh, liberation of sugar from the liver, so gluconeogenesis, and you're going to see elevated uh, sugars. And uh, again, as I mentioned, you're going to see uh, systolics less less than 80. Um, so you're, you're, and I, I know when I was put on the stand for the inquest, they asked me, what do I teach the nursing students? And so I would teach you that, that a blood pressure less than 100 on 60, a typically normal blood pressure is of concern and that you would follow up um, in the context of that patient. So if this is a cardiac patient with a grade four ventricle, they might not want the blood pressure greater than 90. I've actually given medication to keep a blood pressure less than 80 because uh, they needed to give the heart some time to heal, but that is not the norm. And so if there was a, ever a question, if a blood pressure was, where would you be concerned? It would be a blood pressure less than 100 or an alteration of 20% of their trending blood pressure. So looking for those subtle changes. Late signs, of course, would be a marked decrease in level of consciousness, uh, cold and clammy. They are going to experience chest pain because of his myocardial ischemia. Again, nursing considerations that you need to, this is a patient that would, would require um, some blood gases and definitely continuous O2 saturation monitoring. You're going to be doing uh, the vital signs every 15 minutes, establishing trends and looking for any alterations. You're going to be also doing a, a respiratory assessment, listening for pulmonary edema, and also a Glasgow Coma Scale. Uh, if there's other indications, then um, you be doing those assessments very often, and probably this is a patient that should be in the intensive care unit. We do now have rapid response teams that if you see a patient with alteration in vital signs, you may alert the rapid response team to come and provide immediate interventions. The rapid response team being that team uh, designated at each hospital, it might be an RN from the ICU, it might be a RT, it uh, might be some um, other folks uh, working under medical directives. They can apply oxygen, they can do blood gases, they can do an electrocardiogram, and they can get the treatment initiated. And the, the idea and the premise behind these rapid response teams was to decant the ICU. So if they can prevent an admission to the ICU, then um, that's, that is a savings to the patient and to the system. Um, so again, with being cardiogenic shock specifically, you want to be monitoring for any kind of arrhythmias. When the heart becomes ischemic, as you know, you're going to see uh, cardiac arrhythmias such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So as you start to see increased uh, arrhythmias, um, that is concerning because they're not having adequate cardiac output with all of those arrhythmias. Um, what else did I want to mention? So this is a patient that you are going to be administering. We try to give some kind of analgesic if they're, because they're experiencing chest pain. It's an ischemic heart. So you may tr you, you need to get some analgesic on board, but they often can't tolerate it. So we need to give some kind of a vasopressor, a, which is a potent vasoconstrictor so all the to boost up the blood pressure so I can give a little bit of morphine. And we know that morphine actually causes vasodilation. But even one milligram of morphine, two milligrams of morphine, because of the um, anti-anxiety effect. Also, in a cardiogenic shock, I want to help the, the heart unload that ventricle because they've got massive vasoconstriction. We've got that clamping down the periphery. So remember that uh, when the, the heart tries to eject, that that uh, that that the the um, stroke volume and that, that amount of fluid in that left ventricle is uh, trying to eject, there is so much, uh, there's such a high resistance, systemic resistance, it can't unload and it doubly it works the heart even harder. So 
that that you need to really help unload it and so oftentimes morphine will be a ideal because it will just give you enough vasodilation and decrease anxiety this is a patient that's going to be required to be on telemetry monitoring and treating those arrhythmias and do remember that the heart likes potassium so we have to make sure that the potassium is adequate so that that um, the patient set to help optimize all systems uh, it, these are the patients that have, they're under such a fight or flight, the sympathetic innervation that their glucose is maybe high off the Richter scale. They may be 20. And so we need to get some insulin for these patients as well. We need to stabilize their cardiac status. So we need to give something that's going to increase the contractility of the heart. Um, medications th that we use and I'm going to get you to go back to Dana's lecture on pharmacology. Did she talk about cardiac glycosides? Cardiac glycosides or medications that will increase cardiac contractility. So one drug that increases cardiac contractility, digoxin, it's a... Uh, it, it increases contractility and it slows down the heart rate at the AV node. So it does two things. Helps to slow it down so there's le less demand on the heart, but also it increases the contractility. Other drugs we use in the ICU setting would be dopamine and dibutamine. Again, as I mentioned, you optimize your electrolytes. And, and I want to see what my, my urea and creatinine might be because I want to see if there's any kidney involvement. I want to see if there's enough, if the, if the kidneys have already taken a hit that the patient, that they're starting to shut down and that the urinary output may not be suffice. And so I'm looking to see if there's any a change in the urea and creatinine. Also, this is a patient they may do a liver profile. See if there's any um, gut ischemia or ischemia to the liver. Okay, so moving along to the uh, the next type of shock, and we've talked now about, I just want to refer to, we've talked about hypovolemic shock, we've talked about cardiogenic shock, now we're going to talk about distributive shock. And distributive shock is uh, the tank being too large. So you have a massive big tank, and you're filling, it, you're filling this big huge drum, this 50-gallon drum up with a, with a cup one cup measure and so you the, the the blood volume may be could be normal but the compartment is expanded for some reason and, and so it can't keep can't maintain a blood pressure so the tank is too large this is divided into three main categories neurogenic anaphylactic and septic shock but they're all characterized by the loss of blood vessel tone uh, there's enlargement of the vascular compartment and displacement of the blood away from the heart. So if I can, if you can work with, this is an analogy that I like to use. So if you think of the TED stockings that you put on your patient, those really tight, um, like a pantyhose type thigh high sock that you stretch get on the patient's leg and it's, man, it's worth getting those on. And remember that they should be coming off once a shift so you can do your assessment and give the legs a bit of a break. But Putting those dot that gives you a nice, that's what the vasculature is like. It's nice and tight and nothing's leaking out of there. However, when you have distributive shock, it's like wearing fishnets and everything. So the fishnets, there's not the same tone, not the same tightness, and everything's leaking out through those diamonds. And so that is how everything is shifting out of the vascular space. And the causative mechanism is the, um, the imbalance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So you have um, a decrease in a decrease in the um, systemic vascular resistance. There's pooling of fluid in the periphery, and also low sympathetic tone. So with neurogenic shock, which can cause me by a, a head injury or spinal cord injury. I typically see this in a spinal cord injury. And so the, they lost the effect of the sympathetic and that nice balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And especially uh, with a spinal cord injury, as I mentioned, they lack that sympathetic tone. 
because of the injury. And so they don't have that ability to vasoconstrict because remember, alpha receptors constrict in the periphery. They've lost that ability to vasoconstrict in the periphery and, it sh and they, they can't shunt the blood back. It just sits in the periphery. But not only that, because of this type of shock, because of this type of shock, it causes a change in the membrane permeability and everything shifts out. Um, and so, what else did I want to mention? Um, it's a, a low systemic vascular resistance. So we talked about your SVR with cardiogenic shock. This becomes wide open and hypovolemic and cardiac shock, it is clamped down tight. Whereas in Neurogenic shock is wide open and it's everything's leaking out. The, because the fluid is all sitting in the periphery, it's not getting, there's not forward flow getting back to the heart. And so there is this imbalance, um, as I mentioned, in the sympathetic parasympathetic uh, systems. It's causing massive vasodilation. There's a reduction in this vasotone. So if you think of those TED stockings, they're nice and taut tight, tight, everything's going back to the heart, but now you got those fishnets on and everything is just sort of sitting there or even leaking out. It causes vasodilation, it causes a decrease in the cardiac output, and it causes hypotension. There's an inadequate cardiac output and the blood pressure begins to fall. This is really characterized, the patient can um, become, get bradycardia, can be fainting. Uh, and so uh, this, also, as I mentioned, leads to hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion being lack of blood flow to the targeted organs. Uh, what else? Did I want? So, yeah. So, with a neuro a neurological injury, as we mentioned, you know how that you, that that as the as the compensatory mechanisms for that begin to fail, you get more pressure on the vasomotor center, and this is what's happening, and you get bradycardia. So how do you use nursing management of this? So careful um, neurological assessment. So Glasgow Coma Scale, and we know the Glasgow Coma Scale is a standardized measure for, for assessing level of consciousness. It is a well-validated tool. So that means it has been established in multiple settings that this will work. And you see in TV, you know, they're rushing that patient through emerge, GCS of 12. And, and so the, um, uh, the physician team, all of the team knows what the Glasgow Coma Scale is. Uh, you're going to watch for DVTs from blood pooling. Um, monitor the, for the temperature because you've got this massive vasodilation, it's allowing more fluid to be cooled so the patient can become cold. Watch for increased intracranial pressure and remember all of those, those hallmark features of increased intracranial pressure being a change in level of consciousness, a unilaterally dilated pupil that may or may not react to light. Early sign of increased intracranial pressure is a unilaterally dilated pupil. So the left pupil is a three, the right is a four. They both react. That's early signs. Then they progress that both become four and then they both don't react. They might become up like, like to an eight. So watch for signs of increasing intracranial pressure. Remember that signs of increasing intracranial pressure changes in the, the level of consciousness. You're going to get that, again, that widening of the pulse pressure as the heart rate trends down. You get that bradycardia. Um, if, this is, if this is due to a, an anesthetic agent, then reverse anesthetic if appropriate. Anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock is probably one of the most common basal, the common causes of distributive shock. It's a widespread systematic response to an antigen. And if I can re refer you back to your notes from Patho about the antigen antibody response and how that causes um, uh, increased membrane permeability or histamine release, then you get vasodilation, then you get that change in the um, membrane permeability and everything shifts out. So that's, um, that allergic response uh, leading to anaphylactic, anaphylactic shock usually occurs on the second exposure. See that, remember that first exposure produces the antibodies. Common antigens include shellfish, peanuts, uh, pollen, penicillin, insect bites, what are some of those other causes of anaphylactic shock? Some really odd ones. 
Um, and so they are the they are the most serious type. Uh, most serious type of distributive shock is anaphylaxis. And the allergen provokes the defense reaction, which results, as I mentioned, of histamine release. You get that peripheral um, edema and pooling, vasoconstriction of smooth muscle. Where do you find smooth muscle? If you said in the lungs, you're absolutely correct, in the bronchioles. And so you get that vasoconstriction in the lungs, and then you, the patient ends up in respiratory distress. Respiratory and cardiovascular collapse can occur in minutes. They also get anxious. They can have GI distress, and then um, a fall in blood pressure. And so this is a very serious reaction. I'm not sure if you've had the experience where uh, – People have said, oh, well, <clears throat> you, know how to, you know how to give an EpiPen. Well, I have to say, I've never used an EpiPen. We don't teach our students how to use an EpiPen. So if uh, somebody said, well, you're the nurse. You can take care of the allergy, allergic response. Make sure you know how to work their EpiPen and make sure they're not expired. The other thing is EpiPens are very expensive. So I'm not sure how people afford to up, update them if they don't have a, a health plan. They're very expensive. Nursing consideration, so really looking for that hypotension. Uh, it, again, increase in heart rate. Um, you're going to have tachypnea, and you may even experience mild pyrexia. Um, you need to withdraw the antigen immediately. So if it is a if it's a, a bee sting, it's kind of already done. But if it's uh, you know peanut butter in the area, and some people are so highly allergic to peanut butter, it only has to be in the area. It, it could be the, a, a, a tiny bit of residue on a, a knife. And so you need to optimize the ventilation and oxygenation. Get the oxygen on the patient. Um, this patient may deteriorate, so you want to be able to have somebody managing the airway, may need intubation quite quickly before they actually develop uh, th throat swelling and edema. So immediately you want to provide um, IV antihistamines such as Benadryl, uh, Atarax might, they might administer as well. This patient receives epinephrine uh, injection. So we would give epinephrine sub-Q. Sometimes I am, but ch typically sub-Q. Never IV. We never give epinephrine IV to a beating heart. That would be that would be the wrong thing to do. And then IV steroids to decrease the anaphylactic reaction. Um, and this patient may need a, um, a, a, a as I mentioned a difficult airway when they intubate. They have to see the vocal cords. That's their target. They have like a little triangle of the glottis, and they're looking for that triangle. If there is edema from the tongue, et cetera, and they can't see the cords, then it, it, they can't really intubate because they'll end up in the esophagus. So what they'll do is get the emergency, the difficult airway tray, and they may use that, um, and there's a little scope with that, or they may actually just have to do a cricoid thyroidectomy and just go in through the throat. Moving on to the to the most common, so if anaphylaxis is the most serious um, uh, of of these of neurogenic shock of, of distributed shocks, septic shock is what is the most common type, and so it it also carries a quite a high mortality of fifty percent, usually due to bacteremia uh, from um, a UTI, and quite often, it you, people most at risk would be the older adult or the very young or neonates, or those that are immunocompromised to someone undergoing chemotherapy. And so these inflammatory me chemical mediators are released, and so there's different stages of shock. Initially, you're going to go into the patient will go into early shock, which is considered warm shock. So they have this fever, they have massive vasodilation as their body's trying to compensate for this high fever, and they have increased cardiac output. Interestingly, this is a, one of the, the few times you're going to see an, a hyperdynamic state increase in the cardiac output, and uh, the, the, um, Patient will experience uh, oftentimes a bit of peripheral edema as the with due to this vasodilation, and then uh, the skin is 
hot pink, usually hot to touch, red, pink, red or pink, and warm. And then as the patient continues that they go into cold shock, when their blood pressure starts to drop, their urinary output begins to drop, their heart rate starts to increase, and their body shifts from anaerobic metabolism, uh, shifts to anaerobic, from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. And so... Uh, you see this uh, lactic acidosis building up and again this respiratory acidosis as they as it's trying to correct that for that acidosis and we'll talk about that in year four just to know that in shock conditions you get a metabolic acidosis uh, so nursing considerations for septic shock will be to send off the blood, send off the urine, send off cultures, and then treat with initially broad spectrum antibiotic. And then as I've uh, cautioned you uh, repeatedly to go back and check your cultures and make sure that the patient is on the correct antibiotic. Support the cardiovascular system. So this patient, because it is a a distributive shock, the tank is too big, they're going to need a lot of fluid. So the early treatment of early sepsis is massive amounts of blood, uh, of fluids. High flow oxygen as required. Patient may need some inotropes. And so this, uh, you may give, a, the patient may be ordered a bit of dopamine, uh, dopamine infusion to help a little bit of that vasoconstriction uh, to shunt blood back to the, to the um, heart brain and the lungs. So if it's not corrected, it may progress to late septic shock with, with a very high mortality rate. And oftentimes, this is what's really uh, uh, causes the demise of our older adult population is late septic shock due to a urosepsis. Uh, we talked about this, that, so in th those shocks, I'm just going to stop for a second here uh, and entertain any questions. So, anybody have any questions about um, hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, or distributed shock? I'll just give you a minute, just put them up into the chat feature. Okay, and so we've already alluded to some of these comments uh, around compensatory stage. So in the early stages, as we've already mentioned, there, the vital signs are normal, and that's very, you know, very, you, you're comforted thinking, oh yeah, vital signs are stable, not a problem. But in fact, the damage is occurring at the microcellular level. So you, the patient may have that increase in heart rate and respiratory rate, Heart rate may be up by 10 beats only. It may be up by more, but it could be up by only 10 beats. The patient becomes cold in the peripheries, clammy. Urinary output um, is, is uh, diminishing, but still maintaining 30 mils an hour because there's an adequate blood pressure perfusing the kidneys. Uh, blood is being shunted away from the GI tract, so you're going to hear decreased bowel sounds. This is when the patient gets a little bit anxious, a little bit restless. Moving into progressive shock, the, the, organs, the perfusion of the organs are adequate but are, are, is inadequate and the organs begin to fail. And as I mentioned, typically the liver and the GI tract first to take a hit, the cardiac output is insufficient, so the blood will be diverted from the GI tract to the heart, the brain, and the lungs. Um, then the kidneys, the blood is going to be re-diverted from the kidneys, re-diverted from the periphery, my, great, my big toe, it's going to come back to the heart. Then the blood pressure starts to dr drop less than 75 millimeters of mercury. Um, your mean arterial pressure may be 50. Uh, heart rate is greater than 150. So you can imagine that you've already got this failing system and now increased demands. Pulse becomes weak and thready. Don't palpate any peripheral pulses. So I always feel rest assured that when I can feel my distal pulses, that I've got an adequate blood pressure. Um, the changes in membrane capillary permeability, so you have widening of those spaces and the fluids leaking out into the periphery. 
And even at this stage, even if we were able to give blood, even if we were able to give a massive amount of blood transfusion, even if we were able to give um, epinephrine for anaphylaxis, this patient, that there's already such end organ um, dysfunction that likely this patient will not survive. The patient is experiencing oliguria to anuria. Remember that oliguria is urinary output less than 400 mils in 24 hours or less than 20 mils an hour. You're going to see fluid and electrolyte imbalances and you're going to see a lot of cardiac dysrhythmias. Irreversible continues on if the patient is untreated they inevitably progress to irreversible uh, shock end stage shock you'll hear that when, when things are um, irreversible we refer to that as intractable so you may even hear the term intractable shock we can't change it it's just going to carry on no matter what the interventions are so cardiac hepatic renal respiratory pancreatic so of course you're going to see sugars elevate because you're not the, the pancreas is so hypoperfused that it's not able to liberate any insulin from the island of Langerhat. Um, you're going to have hematological dysfunction so as i mentioned you're going to experience the patient will experience dic and neurological failure the the organ damage is now uh, irreversible and death is imminent. Okay, so I just wanted to hold it there for a moment. Um, again, I think we've talked about the different stages of shock, knowing that nursing interventions are always targeting those early stages of shock, looking to see what are the, what is going on here? What is the picture? What are the patterns? Is there a lot of blood loss? So when I had my maternal death, um, the novice nurse was asked, was there any vag loss? She said, yeah, there was about four or five pads. Peri pads were saturated, but having lacked the experience, she thought it was just a large amount when in fact it was, uh, she was hemorrhaging. And so it's really recognizing the early signs, looking at that, that blood pressure that's been around 100, now it's 90. Okay, what's going on here? Always, always, always reporting changes in your vital signs to your co-assigned and your instructor or your preceptor. Very important because while you may not think the patient looks differently, these are early signs that I have noticed being missed. Okay. So let's go on and talk about some other med surge emergencies that you may be experiencing uh, in the clinical area. Let me see if I can pull this up here. Oh, I think I have to come off my screen share. I'm going to come off my screen share and then I have to go back on to my next one. So I just wanted to pull up. I wanted to talk a little bit about compartment syndrome. I quite let me just pull this. Uh, this is a really good little video clip that says it much more eloquently than I do, although I do like to narrate what he's saying. I just wanted to talk a little bit about compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome, you can see in a variety of settings. While we typically associate it with a large bone fracture, such as the femur, uh, you can see compartment syndrome of the lower leg. You can see it of the arm. I've seen where an intravenous, uh, an intravenous was, ex uh, it, it, oh, what is the word I'm looking for? When it, it actually causes necrosis of the site. So the medication extravasated. The medication extravasated into the arm, caused necrosis around, and then that, because of the eschar, or it caused kite constriction, and we ended up with a compartment syndrome of this lady's arm. So I want you to be aware, compartment syndrome is a serious emergency. And I just, I like this little video clip. I'll try not to talk. 
or in a hemophilic patient. The anterior compartment is the most commonly involved compartment of the thigh. Clinical presentation of anterior compartment, knee in extension attitude, pain with passive flexion of the knee because we're stretching the quadriceps muscle. Severe tenderness over the anterior thigh. Parathesia over the medial aspect of the knee, leg, and foot. It is the course of the saphenous nerve. Weakness on knee extension. Pressure measurement. Once the compartment pressure become elevated, fasciotomy is the treatment of choice. When you suspect compartment syndrome of the thigh, the intercompartmental pressure is measured. If the pressure is high, fasciotomy is the treatment. Here is where and how to measure the pressure of the thigh. And this is how to do fasciotomy of the thigh. It is a lateral incision over the thigh. After the skin is incised, the tensor fascia lata is open to decompress the anterior compartment of the thigh. This is an example of fasciotomy of the thigh. This is an example of uh, fasciotomy of the thigh. Notice that the tensor fascia lata is open and the anterior compartment muscles are bulging through the incision. Here it, the fat is used to treat the wound after fasciotomy is done. Here is an example of closure of the fasciotomy wound. I'm hoping that you were able to hear that um, that recording from uh, from YouTube. I find that's a really clear illustration of what compartment syndrome is. And so, if you recall from that video clip, that the, if you think of the thigh, there's three compartments. There, there's three compartments in that, and in running in there are the nerve, the artery, and the vein. When you have an injury distal, distally, such as a fracture or other, you end up with this compression of the vein. And remember, the vein is a very soft-walled system, so it doesn't take a lot, and it becomes engorged. Once it becomes engorged, it puts pressure on the arterial side of things, and as there's increased pressure in that pocket uh, in that um, compartment you end up putting pressure on the nerve it is the, and as you can see it with my fingers how it ends up uh, as that white becomes ischemic that is, ischemia causes excruciating pain it is that excruciating pain that alerts you that something is not quite right it, and so it, um, if you if you gave your patient to Percocet and the patient is now screaming with pain, then you're always very concerned that it might be a compartment syndrome. And so the signs and symptoms of, of compartment syndrome uh, would be uh, di uh, poor uh, blood flow distally. Really, that's what you're looking for. So I just want to remember the five, five Ps of, of blood flow. So you want Paresthesia. Does this patient have any uh, numbness or weakness or, or tingling? So paresthesia, paralysis. Is there motor dysfunction? So sensory dysfunction, motor dysfunction. Is there um, pocleothermia? That's a big word, I know. Pocleothermia means temperature. So a therm. So is there any temperature changes? If there is an arterial obstruction, there's no blood flow, the limb is cold. Um, Paresthesia, paralysis, pocleothermia, pain, excruciating pain from ischemia, and pallor. It's white. So those are the five P's of, of um, arterial blood flow. And that's when, when I'm doing my assessment of anyone who has a cast or any kind of distal injury. I'm always checking to make sure that I can get a, the skin is warm and dry, that they've got good sensation. And you might take a tongue depressor and say if they can check test uh, sen the sensation in all of their digits and that they can actually have motor function. So those are the, the assessments that I would be assessing for, for compartment syndrome.
Okay. I'm going to go back to, um, and I know this is just, you all do this, but I just want to remind everyone, we're going to do a, a, just a quick review of, uh, just let me get it, pull up my share screen again. Uh, do the AED. And if anyone needs practice with um, AEDs or CPR, I have CPR mannequins. In fact, um, I am a certified BLS instructor. And I not if anyone needs any uh, BLS, I know that one of the uh, clinical instructors had asked for a, tr a class, and I'd be glad to do it for our nursing students, just at their convenience. I'm not sure how you're doing it now. If that something that you are interested in just let me know and we'll see what we can organize generally i would take classes i can do classes of six because i have six mannequins um and if if it's a larger class of 12 then i have another instructor from trent university that can come to join us so if that's something that you're interested in let me know if you want me to do it in the spring or whatever you need it for your next um clinical i'm not sure how that works uh, just let me know i'll be glad to do it I took my uh, BLS instructors so that I could help with the nursing students, make it more convenient for you. And it's your friends over at Action First Aid. It's been six months since you've taken the last training. Do you remember what to do? Uh, Ian, I think I need some help. You have to under. What's wrong? I just feel really nauseous. Put some pressure in my chest. Okay. Uh, let me just take a seat here. Roger. Roger. Oh. Roger, wake up. Roger. Jane, go call 911. Tell them we have someone who's unconscious. Barb, go get the AED. Bring it back to me as soon as you can. Kelsey, go stand outside and wait for the paramedics. Again, you'll need to do your assessment a little bit faster than that, but for illustrative purposes, they're just doing it step by step. 10 seconds or less to check that first pulse and initiate CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Roger survived because Ian and I had stepped in and remembered our ABCs from training. So let's recap. First, call 911. 